If the appellants are prepared to proceed, they may do so now. Good afternoon, Justices. My name is Michael Marmack, and alongside my co-counsel, Inya Adapo, we represent the, the appellants, the Crown, in today's case. The case before you today is about how can we balance the privacy interests of Canadians with the need for effective law enforcement on the internet, a space which operates uniquely from that traditionally contemplated by the Charter. The internet has qualitatively changed how crimes are committed. Crime can now occur at a rapid pace, with tens or hundreds or even thousands of perpetrators scattered across the globe. Police need to be properly equipped to quickly and effectively solve these crimes in this rapidly evolving space. We submit that the additional requirements we anticipate our friends will suggest upset the balance between this personal privacy and these law enforcement goals, and thus are not reasonable. Our submissions today will be twofold. First, I will submit that the subject matter of the police's inquiry was Mr. Bikevitz's IP address and associated internet service provider. Then, my co-counsel will submit that Mr. Bikevitz did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in this subject matter, and therefore his Section 8 rights were not engaged. Therefore, we ask that we overturn the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada and restore Mr. Bikevitz's conviction. Now, in determining what constitutes the subject matter of a search, it is first important to identify which actions by the police constituted the alleged inquiry in question. As defined in the case of Hunter and Selby, only where those state examinations constitute an intrusion upon a reasonable expectation of privacy does the government action in question constitute a search as understood by section. Is this, is this not a search? Is that what you're suggesting? That the police did initially gather the IP addresses was not a search? We're suggesting that yes, the police's request to Moneris for the IP addresses associated with the fraudulent purchases was not a search as contemplated by section 8 of the charter. In order to determine the subject matter of a police inquiry, a guiding question has been outlined in the case of the Queen and Miranda to ask what were the police really after. In this case, the primary investigator stated so their reason- Is there a position that they're only after the IP addresses? In the preliminary stage of this investigation, yes, Justice. That is what they were after. After that point, the police then obtained the judicial authority to conduct a search. Does America contemplate this sort of preliminary stage of the investigation as you characterize it? America and other cases such as the case of Mills recognize that police investigations into crimes are stepwise and must be considered as stepwise increase. Otherwise, to consider an investigation wholesale to its eventual end would upset the balance that must be struck between personal privacy interests Counsel, is and there those a distinction, a legal distinction, between an investigative step and a search, or are not all, are not all searches investigative steps? All searches are investigative steps, but Justice, you would be correct that not all investigatory techniques employed by police constitute searches as defined by Hunter and Selby. So what is the technique in question that you're speaking of? The technique in question was the police's request to Moneris for IP addresses associated with fraudulent purchases. How is that not a search? Because this request did not reveal any information that Mr. Vykovic had a reasonable expectation of privacy to. So Counsel, is your definition of a search whether or not law enforcement actually produces identifiable results, or is it the process itself? A, a, a police inquiry yields a subject matter. And so what was precisely produced by the police inquiry constitutes the subject matter of the search. But you can't define, you can't define the subject matter as what the police eventually actually obtain, because that ignores I think your point, that ignores exactly the frame in question in America, which is it's what the police are after. 
So it's, it's the intent before the investigation. It's not what ultimately it yields, because otherwise, if it didn't yield anything as a reasonable expectation of privacy, we wouldn't have cases where there's a search because there's a reasonable expectation of privacy regardless of the results, which is what the jurisprudence is, you know? That, that's correct, Justice. And that's why in this case, we consider what the police were, were after, whether or not there was an opportunity for investigation with this specific so what were they, they were after, in this preliminary investigation. No, no, no. What were they ultimately after? They were after their identity, no? In this police investigation, as is the case with essentially every police investigation, the police were attempting to apprehend the suspect. So they were after the person, the identity of the person that committed the fraud, correct? That is correct, Justice. But the subject matter that was obtained through their initial investigatory technique did not allow them to make this conclusion or come to this determination. Counsel, you are applying a very narrow approach to our Section 8 jurisprudence. We've always looked at it at a broad and functional level. Why are you making a very piecemeal argument here? Uh, I'm going to add to that that paragraph 15 of Morocco, citing Ward and uh, Spencer, specifically uh, support my brother Justice's proposition here that a broad approach should be utilized. Well, Justice Sajid and Chief Justice Red Eye, we would suggest that the legal framework for determining what the subject matter constitutes is broad and is contextual to the specific evidence produced on the record. But a key distinction must be made between information that could be revealed by a police inquiry and information that tends to be revealed. Wait, wait, how do you make that distinction? It seems like they're the same point. To use the case of the Queen and Gamba, information that tends to be revealed is information that can be reason that can be drawn from inferences made from the precise subject matter collected. And to illustrate this, I'd like to take you to the factual record as established in Gamba. In order to understand the what an I, IP address will provide, don't we need to know whether or not you're talking about internal or external IP addresses? Yes, Justice. And this external IP address was what Moneris was disclosed to the police in this case. And how does that relate to the principles of law? Well, an external IP address by itself does not tend to reveal any personal or core biographical information on its own. Just as in Gamba, where electrical readings collected by the police did not tend to reveal what was actually going on inside the home. Well, the electrical meter numbers could be described as a string of numbers. Would that be accurate? Yes, yes. Quantitative information can, in fact, provide precision of information. Well, Chief Justice, in the case of Gamba, Gambo, it was this lack of precision that actually led the Supreme Court of Canada to come to the decision that this electrical reading did not tend to reveal those core biographical details. The same is the case here. An IP address on its own, without any connection that is able to sever the link of anonymity, is by itself, does not tend to reveal. There's, there's a major distinction or further distinction, which is the numbers that we're talking about in Gamba have to do with electrical use, whereas here we're talking about internet use, which is something, it would be different if we talked about how much data, just generally, somebody who's using on the internet. We're talking about here, are we not, broader information that actually do provide potentially some insight into people's behavior. Well, the IP address by itself has to be connected to some other information. But isn't it say. always? Can you can you ever divorce divorce the actual numbers of the IP address from the context? The the police in par the police question is always going to have a context associated to it. So doesn't that tend to reveal information that the fire biographical for, or does it have the potential to in a way that influences the normative inquiry? Justice Laws, I would suggest that your question is entirely dependent on the context. And to give you an example, I'd like to point you to the context in which the information was collected in this case, and then the search that actually occurred. The context in the first case were purchases ascribed to an anonymous IP address. And so that context did not reveal any biographical form. The second context, when they actually conducted a search by going to the internet service provider 
The context there was obtaining Mr. Bikerns' personal information, his name and his address. And that context did attract a reasonable expectation of privacy. This is context and fact specific, and therefore we must make these distinctions in each and every case. So is there no, is there no importance then where the transactions are made? If, again, the, the broad normative inquiry, if this was, for example, not a gift card at a, at a liquor store, if this was uh, perhaps an, at a, an adult shop, does that not reveal biographical information, the fact of a purchase at an adult, at an adult shop? The fact of a purchase at an adult shop does not reveal any information until it's combined with a purchaser. All you would be able to determine with that specific context is that an individual who has access to the internet made a purchase from an adult store. But that's a piece, that's a component of somebody's identity. I understand what you're saying, that there's no way of linking it to a person's identity in terms of their name, but don't you agree that there is some aspect of an identity as to what somebody purchases or where somebody purchases something? And the inferences that can be drawn from that. I see that my time has almost elapsed and may I request some additional time to answer that question. This issue was already contemplated in the case of Spencer. Quote, a, a personal, has a personal privacy interest in an attempt to link suspects with anonymously undertaken online activities. The privacy interest engaged is when that link is created between an identity and anonymous activity. Counsel, what do you the citation the paragraph? That's paragraph 50 of the case of Spencer. And this, this attempt can only be made through a judicially authorized search, as the police did in this case. Barring any further questions, my co-counsel will now submit that Mr. Bikevitz did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in his internet, uh, his IP address. You may. Why don't we start out with paragraph 50 that we just heard about, where uh, the court says that it's the request by law enforcement to link that information, to provide identifiers, that gives rise to the privacy interests that is of concern to the court. Where do we have comparable behavior in this particular case, counsel? Yes, Justice. Where we have comparable behavior is where the police officers once they had collected the IP address from an heiress, where they went to the, uh, where they got the Spencer warrant to procure the subscriber information. And so, Justice, this same issue was contemplated by Justice Cromwell in paragraph uh, uh, 46 of Spencer. And uh, Justice Cromwell there noted that when we guard the link between an IP address and the identifying information of an individual, that an individual, a user of internet, can be rest assured that their privacy is secure. And that is the position of the appellants here today, Justice. But counsel, what if they went about it in a different way? What if one of those payments that they knew occurred was a subscription and they approached the third party that the person subscribed to and said, who's the person with this particular subscription? They're not asking for ISP information saying, who's the subscriber attached to this IP address? They're making an indirect link and an inference. How do, what do you say to that? Well, Justice, it would be our position that police officers cannot go to third parties and ask for that personal identifying information, whether it be subscriber information or it be the interactivity necessarily linked to that identity. The police officers would have to procure a Spencer warrant before they can access core biographical information. Counsel, so, you mentioned paragraph 46 of Spencer, and they talk about guarding the link between the information and the identity of the person to whom it relates. So why wouldn't you want to guard the link here with the IP address and that person? Well, Justice, that is precisely what the appellant is saying. 
And if I may adopt the language that has been repeated several times in previous cases of applied hearings, this court has noted that yes, the IP address is the first breadcrumb in a digital show, and that is a characterization that the appellant will want to use. However, the appellant's submission is that- Counsel, you just said this is what the appellant position is, but isn't your position that there's no reasonable expectation of privacy for an IP address? Well, yes, Justice, and getting to that, what the appellant states is that even if one has an IP address, what Spencer does is it serves as a lock that police officers must have judicial authorization before they can unlock. So going back to your question, in paragraph 46 of Spencer, where Justice Cromwell talks about that link, it's the position of the appellant that you don't have that link to the identity of the individual unless you have Spencer. But how, Counsel, will they know, the police know, that they've crossed this threshold where they've reached out to a third party, and perhaps a third party provides more information than is being requested? Well, Justice, to answer your question, I'll point to two facts. One, if you look at the evidentiary record before us, you notice that the police went to Menares, and they told them that they were investigating a specific fraud, and they told them the five transactions that they were looking for. Menares then gave the IP addresses to those two transactions. Exactly. Is that not enough of a standard to get a production warrant to go to Menares and get the information that they're requesting? They simply just have the information from the merchant that there was a theft. Is that not enough to just get a warrant in the first place? Well, Justice, it would be our position that to implement a warrant at the stage of wanting to procure an IP address, we do nothing to secure, to additionally secure the privacy interests of Canadians, but we tip the scale that my co-counsel talked about, this delicate balance where society's interested, yes, in privacy rights, but also interested in the prosecution of crime. Counsel, you're starting to confuse me. Don't we need to guard against the IP? You're saying that we don't need to guard against it. What's your position on this? No, Justice. Do we have a reasonable expectation of privacy in our IP address, yes or no? Justice, to clarify unequivocally, it's the appellate's position that we don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy linked to the IP address because the IP address by itself does not have a link to any core biographical information. And when you look at the evidentiary record of this case, it becomes more evident why this is true. Counsel, can I ask, how do you define core biographical information? Yes, Justice. As was noted once again by Justice Cuomo and Spencer, core biographical information goes beyond just subscriber information, so name, email, or address. Core biographical information would also entail internet activity. So, for example, where one purchases items or what kind of religious or political affiliation that one has. That would be core biographical information, particularly information. So then the information tying an IP address to a specific purchase at a specific place would then reveal information about the types of, about the places that one purchases items, which you've just said is core biographical information. So doesn't that suggest that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy in an IP address? No, Justice. If I may clarify, it becomes core, and the key word perhaps there is biographical information. You can have core, you can have information about an individual. You can have even perhaps core information about an individual. But to have core biographical information about an individual, Justice, we would state requires one to have a link about that individual, an identity of that individual. It is that link to the identity of the individual that Spencer protects. So where are you pulling this from? What's your authority for this core biographical information definition that you're using? Well, Justice, once again, I'm citing from just the case of Spencer, which Justice Cuomo was talking about. And that links to my citation on paragraph 46 of Spencer. Sorry, but I believe in Spencer, and I apologize, I don't have internet, so I can't pull up the paragraph. But I believe in Spencer, it talks about a biographical core information, which is broader than what you're describing, because you're linking core to biographical. But what the case law actually says is that if it relates to biographical information that does not necessarily have to tie into a specific identity, it's protected by Section 8. So how do you respond to that? Justice, how we respond to that is that Section 8, yes, does protect people, not places. And when we talk about core biographical information, Justice, we look at the IP address. And we state that the IP address by itself does not tell us anything core about an individual. For example, in the case of Spencer, police officers got two IP addresses back. But before they got a Spencer warrant, they did not know that it was one individual conducting this. They didn't know where the individual lived. 
It could have been an entity. But you're, again, you're presuming that there has to be a specific individual in mind, and I'm putting to you that the case law does not require an identity or a specific person to be linked to information for it to fall at the biographical core. Well, Justice, in response to that, we look at the analysis of Justice Cromwell and Spencer once again, where he analyzes at least three conceptions of privacy. Privacy as confidentiality, privacy as secrecy or control, and privacy as- what privacy consists of. You keep mentioning Spencer, and the court talked about how the use of research relies on a normative analysis, meaning we're not just looking at the facts here, but we're going for the broader implications. So if you're not concerned on your position that police can just start accumulating IP addresses, but you're saying they're not a search. Yes, Justice, and so if I may divide your question into two, with regards to whether or not police can just start accumulating IP addresses, we would say that due to the nature of IP addresses, this would not be feasible for police officers. Why not? Do, for example, Justice, to answer your question, we can set the case of Ward. And Ward notes that there are at least 4.53 billion IP addresses, and that these IP addresses, even during the same connection, that's paragraph 21 of Ward, during the same connection, these IP addresses- But you're assuming that they're gonna start collecting these billions of IP addresses. They don't need to do that. They can, the Calgary police can just start collecting IP addresses of Calgary residents. Well, Justice, there are hundreds of thousands of residents in Calgary. Furthermore, to compound that problem is the fact that IP addresses themselves are dynamic. So if, for example, even if we take the IP address of Mr. Bikovitz, a month later, or perhaps even 24 hours later, that IP address could have been reassigned to another individual. To then posit that- So it's not impossible for law enforcement to say 24 hours ago, this IP address still belonged to this individual. The dynamic nature of IP addresses doesn't help you sufficiently, does it? Well, Justice, that is correct. The police officers could have gone to the ISP that at this particular time, at this particular day, we want, this was linked to a transaction. However, once again, this goes back- But they don't need to go to ISP. That's not what they did here. They can go to a third party. Well, Justice, it would be the position of the appellant that even if police officers should try to go to a third party, Spencer protects that. And this is noted, again, Justice Cromwell ties in this notion of the core biographical information and subscriber information, and he notes that Spencer is what sufficiently ties it in. I'll take you back to this concern about police collecting a database of IP addresses. Once they've done so and they go to the third party, that reveals an enormous amount of information that's potentially unrelated to the investigation. To use an analogy, it's as though the fingerprint that they lift from a crime scene is not only that fingerprint, but the fingerprints left by that individual at every place they've visited for however long that IP address persisted, say a month. That's a lot of unrelated, deeply private information, so don't we need to take the additional steps to protect that? Justice, in your response to your question, you would say that when police officers may go to procure a Spencer warrant, the judge can limit, so two possibilities. Police officers ask the ISP for particularly what they're looking for, and as they're procuring the Spencer warrant, the judge can then limit the scope of what they should be able to receive. So tell the police officers, the ISPs that I'm giving you, the IP addresses that I'm giving you for those. So we're still going back to the ISPs. Where in Spencer does the court contemplate third parties that are not ISPs? Because that's what we're dealing with here. Justice, I see that my time has almost elapsed. Briefly, please, respond to that conclusion. Well, Justice, I would cite paragraph 50 of Spencer, perhaps, where the court discussed the fact that third party sites and core biographical information are also protected under Spencer. And most importantly, the appellants are citing Spencer to note that there is a lock between linking the identity of an individual to their IP address. Justice, if there is no ability to procure the identity of an individual, it is our position that an IP address does not have an objectively reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, are there any further questions? This concludes the submissions on behalf of the appellants. Thank you, counsel.
Now, since our just before you jump into your regularly scheduled programming, can you tell me what was the most damaging thing that you heard your friends say? Because I'd like to ask your response to this. If you could just think about how you've been listening for about 20 minutes to the, the opponent's submission, what was the most damaging thing they had to say? And what's your response? Justice, it was regarding the submissions that Spencer would extend to uh, the police approaching third parties for information relating to an IP address. And Justice, if you'd like to hear a response to that, we find it is an overextension of what Spencer holds and it to be incongruent with their position that IP addresses and their activity do not attract reasonable expectation of privacy. If the court were to hold that, the police would be free to approach I excuse me, third parties, and ask what an IP has done. However, we will not know until the information is received from the third party, whether or not it will reveal an individual's identity. And that is directly at odds with what was held in the court between Hunter and Sub Incorporated. The purpose of Section 8 is not, is, excuse me, is to prevent unjustified searches from the onset, and they've contended it is not enough to simply know in an ex post facto analysis that a charter breach has occurred. That is why we find it essential that a general rule be made that any time police request an IP address for the associated internet activity, that a warrant requirement is triggered. Counsel, can you speak to concerns that that would hamper the investigations and the release of judicial resources? Yes, Justice Ellis. There are already legislation in place to aid in this issue. I would turn to section 481 of the criminal code that gives permission for telewarrants. These are available over the phone if there is general delay in the in-person judicial system that provides warrants. How long does it take to get a telewarrant? Justice, it would depend on the current caseload and a numerous factors. I, I cannot speculate to that. So counsel, you're agreeing it's still in focus, right? Even though the telewarrant is still required for judicial resources there. Justice, absolutely. However, this court, the court seeks to strike a balance between protecting an individual's privacy interests and the interests of the state to advance law enforcement. Actually, on that point then, I, when we decide this case, and I'm sure you know, we have to think about these reasonable hypotheticals. So, you know, police really do need these tools uh, that are necessary to conduct their investigations, especially when it comes to uh, online crimes, uh, specifically against children. And in Friesen, the Supreme Court held that when an apex court like ours is defining and calibrating the law for enforcement interests in these types of cases, we have to consider the harm done to children in sexual crimes. So, my question is, doesn't your position effectively hamper these sorts of police investigations moving forward, where they do need to uh, move quite swiftly to obtain an IP address when we're dealing with crimes against young, vulnerable children? Yes, Justice Lawrence Stanley. And if I could turn to another provision within the criminal code, there exists an exception for exigent circumstances for the warrant requirement. So if there is a potential loss of data or an individual is risk being harmed currently, as you put a child, the police can subvert the warrant requirement in such a strenuous scenario. What's, uh, what standard would be required to obtain the authorization that you're seeking? Justice, is it, could you clarify the standard? What would be the, what, what would police need to, what standard would the police need to establish that they have in terms of suspecting that an IP address would assist in the investigation? Yes, Justice. So the current provision is criminal code 487.016, and the standard for that is reasonable probable grounds. Is that too high? Justice, that is up for legislators and for this court to interpret. However, there also exists section 487.015, which is purely for transmission data, which an IP address and not the internet activity would fall under. And this standard is purely reasonable suspicion. So would you concede with your friend's submission that IP addresses can be dynamic and change over time? Yes, she sucked the Chief Justice for Red Eye. However, however, we do not, it, it depends how long they change. They could be a day, it could be an hour, a month. But law enforcement doesn't necessarily know that prospectively. And so you can see from an evidentiary perspective that given the seriousness of certain criminal matters, 
there may be a changing circumstances that makes it more difficult for them to find offenders. Yes, Chief Justice Fred Adam, if you bring forward two points that matter. First, that although IP address is strange, as the expert contended in Ward, the ISP still logs a complete record of every IP address ever logged to an individual. But that still introduces an additional evidentiary delay for them to resolve those discrepancies. Justice, not necessarily. If they have the particular crime, let's say in this case, the liquor store transaction, they could still proceed normally and get information related to this. What do you mean by normal? Excuse me, proceed without further additional steps. They need not collect every IP address ever correlated. There may be information revealing itself in this one single dynamic IP address. Justice, it was possible in that case that, yes, he was purchasing liquor from an online liquor store. Say even it was as quick as IP address change in half an hour. It is unknown whether he Googled, let's say, his postal code related to his address. The information, although they're dynamic in an IP address, it can still be highly revealing. Counsel, don't you think that that proposition is true, that would have come up in the evidence? Like, don't you think that the smart lawyers who argued this case at the trial level would have put that overwhelming evidence of enormous details of privacy leaks to a single dynamic IP address in the evidence at trial? Justice Lowe, it's not necessarily that. Was that investigation? Sorry, wait, Counsel. They would have had this amazing evidence which would have won them the case and they would have left it out of trial? You're telling me that the lawyers at the trial were losers and just wanted to have it happen in the case? Excuse me, if I could clarify my position. If that had occurred, they very well may have used it. And it did not, but it was possible if they choose to pursue internet activity through Google or another search engine. But if what you're talking about, if they have an expert that could have said, well, this is how IP addresses work, and as you have described, what you're saying is true, that that is a privacy concern. If all this, if they looked at their own IP address, if they looked into Google, my name is Mr. Criminal, like if really that's all the stuff that attaches to a dynamic IP address, don't you think that they would have produced an expert at trial to tell the judge that and we wouldn't be here? Justice, if that had occurred, it would have been a charter breach under her position if they approached a third party and got activity related to internet. That is particularly what our position seeks to protect, as this is revealing information, and thus we propose that a warrant requirement be in place due to the relation between an IP address and the biographical court. Counsel, I'd like to hear your submissions on whether or not there should be a right to anonymity online for Canadians. Yes, Chief Justice Heredia, and the answer is yes, and particularly that link being the IP address between your activity and all other activity you commit on the internet. Counsel, your response to your friend's position on that in Spencer was to narrow their reading of Spencer and characterize that they read it too broadly. If this court interprets Spencer the way they put to us that we should, does this not solve the problem that you're concerned with? Do we not just not worry about the IP address and just broaden the holding in Spencer to protect better the link between the IP address and the biographical court? Justice, if you made that decision to broaden Spencer from here, that that would be a suitable remedy under our position. However, that would not change the fact that Mr. Bikevitz was not protected by what Spencer would now hold. So a charter breach still would have occurred at this case as that warrant requirement is not in place. So if we broaden Spencer and don't protect the IP address but we protect the link, that's good enough for you? Justice, it's our position that the IP address is the link between an individual's activity on the internet. And what? Their activity on their internet and ultimately their identity. But no, that's – what you're talking about is protected already by the Spencer court. How is what you're proposing any different? Justice, we are proposing that there's a contradiction in our friend's position that the activity – Is there also a contradiction between your position and what's in Spencer? Didn't Spencer itself say that there shouldn't be a right to an anonymous internet and instead it should be contextual and fact-specific? Justice, contextual and fact-specific – excuse me – fact-specific, yes. So the individual terms that a user engaged in with a third party, say their contracts or the information they divulged, that may be relevant. So instead of conducting a case-by-case analysis, that is why we apply and propose a general rule that they be protected. Well, I mean that also runs against Ward and the holding in Ward 
and prevents the court from looking at the specific circumstances in which an IP address emerges through an investigation. Justice, I see my, excuse me. Can you restate your question, Chief Justice? Justice Doherty also had this similar uh, conclusion in Ward, which is that the totality of the circumstances are still required in order to assess whether or not Section 8 is engaged. And having a requirement for a warrant doesn't allow the court to look at the totality of the circumstances. Justice, our position is the requirement for a warrant would allow the justice to look at the totality of the circumstances at an earlier stage. They will be able to look at what the police are investigating and if it's justified to intrude. But it presumes that there is some right to anonymity, does it not, by requiring judicial supervision? Justice, as I see my- Briefly respond, please. Yes, Justice, anonymity is at play, however, by protecting an IP address itself, we ensure that they do not proceed through third parties. Thank, Thank you, you Justice. Thank you. 
Well, Justice, I, I point out that, for example, in the seminal case on computer privacy, we had, we had Google. They said we don't want it to search the computer. And then we had Cole. It was a more nuanced situation. The police officer didn't know exactly whether or not the requirements of Google would apply. The court said we'll take a more uh, case specific analysis, and they still determined the police did a good warrant. And again, the same thing happened in Reeves. What the respondent's position is, is that since this is the seminal case for private IP addresses, this court's decision will determine the general rule for future police officers, as well as what Canadians can expect going forward. So now you're saying that just because the previous jurisprudence has taken later steps in the investigation and said, now you need a warrant, 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 that at this early step, I, I can't think of what's before an IP address in an internet investigation. At this very first step, now you want a warrant. Yes, Justice. And it happens to be the case that the initial investigative step okay. does so align with the investigative. How do you imagine the police are going to get this warrant that you're proposing at the first stage? Well, this court need not make a decision on the particular judicial pre authorization scheme as noted by Justice Laforest and Wong. However, we would point to, as my colleagues, no, sorry, no, we just tell the police officers, yeah, you need to get a warrant. According to who? According to this case, how do we do it? I don't know. That's, that's your solution? No, Justice. We, we would recommend section 487, subsection 015 for uh, transmission data, where the police officers could obtain an IP address on the reasonable grounds of suspect standard. Furthermore, Justices, I'll, I'd like to draw an analogy to Morocco. Because in Morocco, it was similarly a seminal case. It was a seminal case for text messages. And what the court said in Morocco was well, that- I'm confused. Just because something is a seminal case, does that mean that the law has to necessarily extend? It's not that the law has to extend, but the law has to, the, the courts have to clarify what the police officer's powers are. That's so what I'm, I guess the real question is, IP addresses were obviously part of the factual matrix of Spencer. What's changed in the past 10 years as it relates to IP addresses that warrants this expansion of the law? Into a bright line rule. In the case of Spencer, Justices, most importantly, the IP address of Mr. Spencer was publicly accessible to anyone standing in this room because he was using a file sharing program. And as per paragraph 13 of the trial judge's reasons, the IP addresses of these users are publicly broadcasted to everyone. Well, what, what makes that different? I understand the factual, we all know the factual distinctions, but what makes that different in law that substantiates the creation of a bright line rule? Just as a follow-up, counsel, you mentioned in Spencer, the distinguishing factor there was that he had shared his IP through a publicly accessible program, but IP addresses are public information, are they not? No, Justin, we would disagree. And to the Chief Justice's question, the distinction between Spencer and the case at bar is that the police in Spencer didn't have to go to a third party to obtain the IP address, whereas in this case, they did. And that's where the respondent draws the line in terms of establishing a general warrant requirement for IP addresses. Now, I'd also like to clarify the record. So does your position then change if they ask for the IP address and um, or I guess not, not ask for the IP address, they ask for something else. And Moneris, in this example, voluntarily gives them the IP address. Our position wouldn't change in regards to IP addresses, but yes, the, that company would be able to disclose that information voluntarily because it's not an IP address. We're advocating for protection of IP addresses. No, I'm saying that Moneris does voluntarily disclose the IP address. Well, there's two points to that. Our, our jurisprudence hasn't explicitly clarified that context. However, it would be the respondent's position that Moneris could tell the police the evidence of crime or whatever they want to report. But in order for the police to receive that IP address, they would have to receive judicial pre authorization. So, sorry, hold on. I want to I want to say I want to stick to this question. So, for cases moving forward, you're saying that if, let's say, Moneris was the victim in this case, and they go to the Is that not the same thing as in a, in a, for example, a sexual assault, a victim going to the police and saying, 
hey, I know this guy, it was this guy, and they can't take his identity? I clarify two points. The respondent is not submitting that victims of a crime cannot report those crimes to the police. What we submit, and this is in congruence with the court's decision in full, which said that although the school board had every right to tell the police the evidence of child pornography on that individual's computer, that right didn't translate to the police being able to receive that computer without prior judicial authorization. And that's the sort of analogy I'm trying to draw in, my, in the respondent's decision. Well, that's a computer, which the case law says is full of all kinds of personal private information. We're talking about a string of numbers to, to that report. Put your final point on it. So what sort of suspicion are the police going to be able to demonstrate in order to get this warrant and then just hand it to the DA? The computer itself was a physical object. In my IP address, it's not. Yeah, to, to add an analogy on that, it's like if I were to say, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm required to have confidentiality for my clients, and if I say to the client, or if I say to somebody, oh, well, I had this client one time, let's call him Bob, uh, he was, and I say details of a crime that he was accused of committing, that's the same as saying, well, this IP address did these five transactions. It's, it's here's a string of random assignees to a, a specific individual who is completely unknown to the subject receiving this information, and here are things linked to that specific random string of numbers or letters. So it's, it's really the exact same thing. So if lawyers can give that kind of information, which is privileged and confidential to random examples, then how is it that an IP address connected to certain transactions online somehow attracts enormous privacy concerns? To answer all of your questions, I'd like, I'd like to take the justices to paragraphs 21 and 22 of the case number. The record says that an IP address is attached to all internet activity. And what that means is that with an IP address- We know that's what the case says, but you've already acknowledged that that's not necessarily true. With VPNs. Not in all circumstances, Justice, yes. We, that's why we propose a general rule, not a bright line rule, because depending on the circumstances, yes, an individual may abandon their presumptive right to privacy in an IP address. How would we craft a general rule without crafting a bright line rule in this particular scenario? I'm not understanding the distinction between saying, well, all IP addresses, as opposed to saying all IP addresses. They seem the same to me. No, Justice. What, what we submit is that when the police request an IP address from a third party, that IP address isn't available to anyone in this room. They can't see it. That would require a warrant. That is our position. And I see my time has elapsed, so barring any further questions, this concludes the response. Thank you, Counsel.